This week, the church celebrates Pentecost, when the disciples, as well as Jesus' mother Mary, all gathered together in one place, praying and awaiting the coming of the Spirit. And, just as had been foretold, the Spirit dramatically arrived, with a rushing sound like wind, and appeared as tongues of fire on the head of each person present. A host of people from every part of the Roman Empire were living or visiting in Jerusalem at that time, and they heard a commotion coming from where the disciples were gathered. They rushed to the place and were astonished to find that they understood, in their own languages, everything that these people from Galilee were saying. It was like a reversal of the confusion of languages that occurred at the Tower of Babel, here depicted by the Dutch painter Peter Bruegel. When we humans grew so full of ourselves that we attempted to build a tower that would reach the highest heaven, God looked down and decided to foil our foolish plan by confounding our speech so that people of different nationalities could no longer understand each other. The Holy Spirit was now reversing that so that people from different countries and tongues actually understood the disciples in their very own language. I think it's remarkable how the arts have this same quality, this ability to bring people together in a common understanding, even if their backgrounds and languages are completely different. Listening to great music, admiring a powerful sculpture, being charmed by the grace and beauty of dance, all these art forms speak to us across any cultural, geographic, or lingued, linguistic divide that might exist. Artists, too, speak to one another across time and distance, building on one another's accomplishments, challenging one another, complimenting a fellow artist by borrowing a signature style or expression, often without sharing a common language or even a common century. When Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel, it became must-see viewing for anyone with even the faintest interest in art and in faith. And his image of God reaching across the heavens to bring the spark of life to Adam rapidly became iconic. I've reversed the direction of the hands here so that Adam's hand is now on the right. Ninety years later, Caravaggio was still citing this familiar image in an obvious tip of the hat to his famous predecessor, both in his Call of Matthew and in his Raising of Lazarus, if you flip that painting horizontally. Here you see all three hands, and you can judge for yourself. Van Gogh and Gauguin famously vied with each other in painterly rivalry, the painting of one responding to the image the other had created. And Van Gogh continues to this day to be a reference point for contemporary artists such as David Hockney, who has been carrying on an animated conversation with Van Gogh for a long time, although working a century later and living in a completely different country. The friendly rivalry of Henri Matisse and Pablo Picasso is legendary and has been the subject of any number of exhibitions. Listen to what one commentator said about these two. Many have dissected and analyzed, lauded or disparaged, and compared their work. Countless more will continue to do so in the passage of time. But for the two icons themselves, Ultimately, there was really only one person whose opinion would ever matter. All things considered, there is only Matisse, Picasso said. And Matisse responded, only one person has the right to criticize me. It's Picasso. Another commentator cited Picasso's remark in old age. You've got to be able to picture side by side everything Matisse and I were doing at that time. No one has ever looked at Matisse's painting 
more carefully than I, and no one has looked at mine more carefully than he. The two painters carried on a wordless conversation for decades, understanding one another in a way that supersedes conventional language. You might well ask why I am going on about the way artists respond to one another, carrying on a dialogue without uttering a word. Well, first of all, because we're celebrating Pentecost and how the Holy Spirit undid the punishment mankind experienced at the time of the Tower of Babel, when people stopped understanding one another. So my first point is that art forms, like the work of the Holy Spirit, help us to understand one another and communicate in a language without words, outside of national or linguistic boundaries. But secondly, I wanted to introduce you to two artists who carried on a dialogue with one another centuries ago while living in two cities that had been waging war against one another for decades, each seeking to grab more territory from the other and vying for economic dominance. The two cities, Florence and Siena, are in present-day Italy, but at that time, Italy did not exist. It was a disparate grab bag of territories or city-states that were in more or less permanent conflict. During the time we're about to consider, the beginning of the 14th century, Siena pledged allegiance to the Pope in Rome, while Florence was loyal to the Holy Roman Empire, dominated by what is now Germany. These two artists set the stage for the Italian Renaissance. Each made contributions that would change the future of art forever. It really began when the artist from Florence named Giotto was commissioned to paint the inside of a chapel in Padua in northern Italy to the west of Venice. This is what you see as you enter the chapel. On the far wall, you see images of the Annunciation with Gabriel on the left and Mary on the right. The walls are completely covered with frescoes one series forming images of the life of Mary, and a second series showing images of the life of Jesus. This is the view looking towards the entrance, with Christ pictured above in glory, inside the almond-shaped mandorla, while a scene of the Last Judgment is unfolding beneath him. What was so completely remarkable about Giotto's work was its naturalism, compared to the highly stylized Byzantine style that had prevailed up until that point. Byzantine art tended to be flat, repetitive, with little attempt made to create the illusion of a third dimension or a variety of personal expressions to humanize and differentiate faces. And it was always full frontal, with the most important figures often standing taller than the rest. So Giotto's fresco of Pentecost, together with all the other scenes he painted in the chapel, was totally revolutionary. You see that he has placed the disciples in an architectural structure that looks three-dimensional. We see the side of it, and it appears to recede in space. The figures are seen in relatively natural poses, some with their backs turned toward us, which was unheard of, and showing a variety of expressions and facial features. Several are looking up to where the rays of the Holy Spirit come down upon them. Some are gesturing with their hands, and their faces have contours and natural coloring. He has created a brilliant illusion of marble at the very base of the structure they are in, and the draperies of the garments they are wearing are realistically folded and arranged in a variety of ways. The only thing Giotto really struggled with was what to do with the halos. There is no problem with the disciples on the far wall who look outwards, but when heads are turned sideways, or when a back is turned toward us, the halo appears at very strange angles in relation to the head. But that is a very small quibble. 
Giotto's work at the Arena Chapel in Padua, otherwise known as the Croveni, excuse me, the Scroveni Chapel, in honor of the patron who commissioned it, was an absolute tour de force. It has been called one of the greatest masterpieces of Western art, and forever changed the way art, as we know it, was done. Word of its naturalism and the way Giotto created the illusion of space, or three dimensions, spread far and wide. And word certainly reached Siena, Florence's rival city, and home of the other great artist of the early, early Renaissance, the proto-Renaissance, Duccio. In 1308, just a few years after Giotto's work on the Arena Chapel was finished, the city of Siena commissioned Duccio to create an altarpiece that would rival Giotto's work and which would reside in Siena's majestic cathedral. It was to be called the Maesta, a name which denotes a very specific and traditional image of the Virgin Mary in majesty, which is what Maesta means, holding the infant Jesus in her arms, often accompanied by images of angels and saints. The central panel of this work is seven feet by 13 feet, so it's very large and imposing. Front and back are covered with images and dozens of separate panels. Here in the front panel, we see the Virgin enthroned in majesty, holding Jesus, surrounded by saints and angels. Beneath and above it are a series of seven scenes from the infancy of Christ and seven from the life of Mary. On the back, there are 26 scenes of Jesus's passion. This enormous panel painting with its narrative of scenes from the lives of Mary and Jesus was Duccio's response to the narrative of similar scenes that Giotto had frescoed on the walls of the chapel in Padua. However, Duccio remained closer to the Byzantine tradition, employing gold backgrounds abundantly and emphasizing the Gothic architecture of the cathedral in the very structure of this large work of art. In the upper right corner of the back of the altarpiece, highlighted by a yellow square here, is the scene of Pentecost. As you can see, all figures are facing us in full frontal positions, as was traditional in Byzantine art. There is a continuous river of gold behind the figures as all their halos merge together and highlight the little flames of the Holy Spirit resting on each head. But unlike Byzantine art, there is something a bit more natural in the expressions on the faces of the figures. And although it doesn't appear in this scene at the Pentecost, in other panels, Duccio has followed Giotto in trying to create an illusion of three-dimensional space in the architecture. Here are two scenes that show this admittedly primitive use of perspective. Jesus before Annas the priest on top, and Peter's first denial of Jesus as he sits warming himself before the fire below. To us today, the work of Giotto and Duccio seems a bit stiff and the depiction of space a bit awkward, but in their time, these two artistic rivals ushered in a revolution in Western art that has rolled on for centuries. They spoke to one another across a divide in space and culture, but each admired what the other was doing and responded to the artistic experiments the so-called rival was conducting. Had it not been for Giotto and Duccio, Titian would not have had such an easy time of it creating a three-dimensional space with a coherent vanishing point, nor would he have so easily created beautiful flowing draperies, expressive faces, and even the shocking naturalism of a barefoot disciple whose feet are actually dirty in this scene of the Pentecost. 
And the same is true of El Greco, whose early training was in the Byzantine tradition of making icons, but who was influenced by the brushwork, movement, color, and naturalism of Titian when he traveled to Titian's native Venice and began creating these elongated, flame-like images of the disciples and Mary in worshipful ecstasy as they receive the gift of the Spirit. So today we celebrate Pentecost and the hope it gives us of a world where people can understand one another, even though they come from different countries and speak different languages. And we celebrate all artists, like Banksy right here, who carry on conversations without words across generations, beyond national boundaries, and outside of the walls of prejudice.